we sing together this morning. 439. <laughs> Four, three, nine. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We for the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to say. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will say. Though they are sliding him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently. He will forgive if they truly believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will say. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. String for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently wend them. Tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Number 503. Number 503, and we'll sing this before our opening prayer. 503. Swiftly we're turning life's daily pages. Swiftly the hours are changing to years. How are you using God's golden moments? Shall we reap glory? Shall we reap tears? Into the Precious message guiding the erring back to the right. Millions are groping without the gospel. Quickly they reach eternity's night. Shall we sit idly as they rush on? Let us call of Christ the true light. Into the hands the gospel is given. Into our hands is given the light. Haste, let us carry God's precious message, guiding the Souls that are dying while we rejoice, our sins are forgiven. Did he not also die for these lost ones? Then let us point the way unto hell. Into our hands the gospel is given. Let us carry God's precious message, guiding the erring back to the right. Let us.
us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this beautiful day we have today and all our many blessings. Thank you for allowing us to gather here in worship. Thank you for Justin and allowing him to be here and give us a wonderful lesson once again today. And thank you so much for everything you do. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Yes. Let's stand together, please. Number 55. Number 55. Five. This is an old song they used to sing way back when or before I was a kid, so we'll try it and see if we can get through it. Number 55 has a really good message in it. Dying with Jesus by death reckon mine Living with Jesus a new life divine. Looking to Jesus till glory doth shine. Moment by moment, our Lord, I am thine. Moment by moment, I'm kept in his love. Moment by moment I fly from above, looking to Jesus till thy wish shall shine. Moment by moment, the Lord I am thine. Never a trial that he is not there. Never a burden that he doth not bear, never a sorrow that he doth not share. Moment by moment, I'm under his care. Moment by moment, I'm kept in his love. Moment by moment I fly from above, looking to Jesus till glory doth shine. Moment by moment, O Lord, I am thine. Never a weakness that he doth not feel, Never a sickness that he cannot heal. Moment by moment in woe or in will, Jesus my Savior abides with me still. Moment by moment I kept in his love, Moment by moment I fly from above, looking to Jesus till glory doth shine. Moment by moment, our Lord, I am thine. Please be seated. Come from Second Chronicles, chapter seven, verse fourteen. And my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn for their pray and seek my face. Evil ways, and I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Number 411, before our message this morning, number 411. <clears throat> Oh, the depth and the riches of God's saving grace Flowing down from the cross for me That the debt for my sins by the Savior was paid And his suffering on Calvary Oh, the depth of such wonderful love 
flowing boundless and full and free. And the debt for my sins was all paid in his suffering on Calvary. How my heart humbly bows in his presence today when I think of his agony. By his stripes I am freed from the bondage of sin through his suffering on Calvary. Oh, the depth of such wonderful love flowing boundless and full and My sins was all paid in his suffering on Calvary. Oh, what marvelous mercy, what infinite love, what immeasurable grace I see. By his blood I am cleansed, I am happy and free through his suffering on Calvary. Oh, the depth of such wonderful love, flowing boundless and full and free. And the debt for my sins was all paid in his suffering on Calvary. After the message, we'll sing number 659. Number 659. All right, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all out this morning. I'm glad you are here with us at the Uport Church of Christ as we have our Sunday morning worship service. Welcome to those as well who are joining us online. It's good to also have you with us. We are honored that you are here as well. This is now our third week in the series on the Sermon on the Mount, uh, given, of course, by Jesus Christ, some of the absolute richest text in the New Testament. In fact, we will end today, if we are lucky, Lord willing, and time works in my favor, which it hardly ever does, we will end our third study on this in the 16th verse of the first chapter. That's how rich this text is, some of the absolute richest text in the New Testament. The very first study we looked at was laying the foundation, the understanding that God's kingdom is here. The kingdom is here. A lot of people want to argue that fact, but the kingdom is manifested on this earth in the church that Christ built. Colossians 1, 13 and 14, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our sins. We talked last week about the look of a Christian in a comparison study uh, on the Beatitudes. The clear distinction between the world and a kingdom citizen. That the reality is there is no blending of the two. You can't be a part-time Christian and a part-time citizen. It doesn't work that way. God has called His people to be different. Now, the inspiration for the sermon today came from somewhat of an unusual place. It actually came from a song on the radio. And Melissa has unfortunately had to hear this song many times. Because it has been stuck in my head for weeks now. And it's actually playing on the radio, which is surprising given it the fact that it calls out a lot of mainstream churches today. But this song has a real message in it to Christians. The, the opening of the song goes like this. Uh, and I want you to understand how difficult it's going to be for me not to sing this to you. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to read it. But the song goes like this, we want our coffee in the lobby, we want our worship on a screen, we've got a rock star preacher who won't wake us from our dreams, we want our blessings in our pocket, we keep our missions overseas, but for the hurting in our cities, would we even cross the street? But we want to see the heart set free, and the tyrants kneel, the walls fall down, and our land be healed. But church, if we want to see a change in the world out there, it's got to start right here. It's got to start right now. 
Lord, I'm starting right here. I'm starting right now. So today we're going to talk about one of the greatest tools that we have at our disposal. That is the Christian influence. The influence that a Christian has on the world. Now, it's easy to sit back and make this statement, because I've said this statement before. I'm just one person. What in the world can I do about everything out there? I'm just one person. I'm sure you've heard this saying before, that actions speak louder than words. And brethren, we need a lot more action and a lot less of what we commonly hear more often in that do as I say, not as I do approach. But you see, the church has a saying as well. You have heard this before, because I've said it several times, and it probably goes way back long before I've said it, that your life is the greatest sermon you will ever give. Some people have absolutely no desire to come sit in this church building and hear a sermon. That's the reality. Hopefully it progresses to that point, but in the beginning, that's the reality. They should see that sermon in your life. They should see it in your life. So think about those song lyrics for just a moment. And again, I know how odd that is. I don't normally use songs in my sermons, but that song has been stuck in my head for weeks. How many churches are more interested in coffee bars than they are evangelism? How many churches are more interested in concerts than they are teaching the truth? Or being awakened from their sleep, as that song said. Meaning that they don't want to face their realities. See, we have many Christians in this world, many Christians in this world on Sundays. Do you want to know what that number of Christians drops to on Monday? It's a whole lot less. You would be surprised. But to the message that Drew just read for us, points to the fact that many in the church... Many churches in a whole have lost their purpose. But Drew read 2 Chronicles 7, 14. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. If you want to see a change in the world out there, and I believe that we do. I'm talking to a room full of, full of Christians. But you have to understand this point. It starts with us. It starts right here. And we can't sit back and say, well, somebody else is going to do it. That's been done so much so that no one is doing it. The world needs to see Jesus and they need to see it in us. So today we're going to talk about the influence that Jesus describes when He's discussing His followers. And this influence His followers have on the world. So what I want to do as we go through this passage today, I want you to compare that then to your own lives. Go ahead and flip over to Matthew chapter 5. It'll be on the screen, but there is no comparison to having the Word of God in your hand. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 13 through 16, Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We make it a whopping two words into this passage. A whopping two words before Jesus makes a major point right here. And we blow right past this and get to the salt and the light. Jesus says that you, the Christian sitting in the room today, you are the salt of the earth. Nowhere in there does it read you might be, you could be sometime when it's convenient, or even you should be the salt of the earth. It says you as a Christian, you are the salt of the earth. If you put that name Christ on then it is important that you remember by whom you were called. Stop acting like it's no big deal. Stop acting like there's not really a calling to it. It is a big deal. There is a calling. You put on that name Christ. You are a Christian. You are 
the salt of the earth. So let's look at a couple of aspects of salt. Because we read that and we're going, okay, well salt's kind of good for flavor, salt's this, salt's that. I want you to notice the importance of salt as it was to them that were reading this message and being given this message. He said, you are the salt of the earth. We've been using salt for years. They used it even more so thousands of years ago. Salt is one of the most common substances on this earth. We mine it from the land. We extract it from the seas. I heard it described this way and it blew my mind and it has stuck with me ever since. If you could draw out all of the salt of the oceans, every bit of it, and lay that salt on the seven continents, you would create a layer 500 feet thick. That's how much salt there is. The salt would form a layer 500 feet thick. Think about how incredible that is. Salt was used in this period for many different facets, some of which you may be unaware of. Did you know that salt was an acceptable form of payment for one's taxes? Wouldn't you like that to be the case today? You ought to try that one time and just let me know how it goes. I don't want to do it, but somebody else try it. Let me know how it goes. Salt was used as a payment in the Grecian Empire in the purchase of slaves, which is where we get the term from, not worth his salt. That's where that came from. But salt also had many other functions that we still use and practice today. So I want to look at just a couple of them. I had to go back and shorten this up for time's sake, so I just got two of each on here that we're going to look at. First off, I want you to notice, not flavor. We often just think, well, salt just means to flavor something. I want you to look at what salt does, other aspects of salt. Salt delays decay. Now, I remember my grandfather telling me stories about this. He was quick to tell you is one of the two boys in a house full of women that it was his job to take the milk to the branch and they stored their milk in the branch because it was cold then his family would either smoke the meat that they were going to have or they coated it in salt the salt of course preserved the meat we know this they didn't have refrigerators when he was growing up they certainly didn't have refrigerators when Jesus was preaching it wasn't thought of Salt, when it's worked into the meat, delays decay. Without it, what would you have? The salt would be the the meat would be rancid, rotten, nasty meat. Will does that make you hungry? Yeah, not me either. I don't want any part of that. I don't want any part of that. It would be worthless, and then just be thrown out. But the question is, if salt delays decay. How exactly then do you apply this to a Christian? Think about a world without salt. Salt, in this case, being Christians with this message. Think about that world without it. What would be the state of decay in this world without salt to preserve it? This world would rot without the positive influence. And you think about it, can we not clearly see this today? Look at places where God has been removed. Schools, politics, the marriage. Look at places where God has been removed and look at how they go. Jesus tells His followers that you are the ones that delay this decay. And you say, well, that, that seems like a bit of a stretch. We're talking about salt being flavor here. Turn over to Genesis chapter 18 for a moment. Genesis chapter 18. Now let's, let's see what salt does as far as delaying decay. Two cities you're very familiar with, Sodom and Gomorrah, are here in focus. These cities are being judged and they're ultimately going to be destroyed. Abraham is told of this. And Abraham pleads to God, to the Lord here, on behalf of these people. Genesis 18, verse 23 and 24. And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you destroy the place and not spare it for 50 righteous that were in it? But Lord, they're, they're righteous people there. You're saying you're going to go destroy these cities. They're, they're righteous people. There are lots there, his nephew. 
What if there are 50 good people? Surely you wouldn't destroy it if there are 50 people. And you know what's amazing about this account? The Lord agrees. He says, you're absolutely right. If there are 50 righteous people, the entire city will be spared. Not because of them, not because of the wicked people. The entire city would be spared because of 50 righteous people. <laughs> well, then Abraham comes back and says, um, maybe that was a bit ambitious. What if there are 40 people there? Would you do it for 40 people? Lord agrees. What if there were 30 people? How about 20 people? And he works his way all the way down to one final plea. Verse 32, Abraham said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but once more. Suppose 10 should be found there. We've started at 50, now we're down to 10. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten people. Ten righteous people in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah was all it would have taken to stop their destruction, to delay their decay. That was it. Everyone in there except for Lot and his family were killed. You know why? Because he couldn't find ten righteous people in the city. Ten. Lot and his family ought to cut it in half just about. He couldn't find any more. And the entire city was destroyed. Ten God-following people would have been enough. And they weren't there to prevent the moral decay. Which concerns me more and more about our own society. So salt delays decay. The next thing, we're going to go back to the original because everybody wants to jump to flavor. Salt enhances flavor. Some foods can be very bland and tasteless until you add just a pinch of salt, especially if you've had my cooking. You need that salt. And then all of a sudden it comes to life. The world can be a very bland and unappetizing place at times. So much bitterness and selfishness, acts being carried out today that will make you sick. You have judges changing the definition of marriage. Politicians voting to kill babies up to the point they're being born. All sorts of abominations taking place. Things that make our society very unappetizing. But what about the influence of just a few godly people? Just sprinkle in a little salt. What happens then? If you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, then you need to possess the attitude that enhances the flavor of our world. We live our lives with the joy and the peace of Jesus Christ. But we don't show that. Why don't we show that? We know in our hearts that we're going to be with Jesus again someday. We don't say that. Why don't we say that? Philippians 4.4, Paul wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. There is a very unfortunate part to this as well. This sounds good. We're going to be the salt. That's great. There is a very unfortunate part. And I'll tell you, this part bothered me when I was doing my study in preparation for this sermon. People see the same tasteless and bitter attitude of the world in those claiming to be Christians today. The Barna Research Group and the owner there, George Barna, did some research on this, they looked into it, and they came up with some troubling conclusions that should trouble anybody in the church. They found, and, and this was kind of the, the headline finding, the average Christian going to an average church is basically indistinguishable from the rest of society. That was his finding from the research he did. Hear that again. Christians are basically indistinguishable from society. Meaning you can't tell them apart. You can't tell which is the Christian and which is the standard member of society. When the rate of, and, and to the points that he made in his article, when the rates of teen pregnancy, uh, marriages ending in divorce, inside the church are essentially the same as society around us, you can't discern the difference between the two. They're basically indistinguishable. And you can take your pick with it, drugs, alcohol, whatever it may be. You, you take your pick. 
You cannot be the salt of Christ and look like the world. If you do, you've lost your flavor. And guess what happens then? It's good for nothing but to be cast out and trampled upon. But that brings up another question. How does salt lose its flavor? Have you opened up your salt shaker before and put it? Man, salt's lost its flavor. Have you ever done that? Salt for us doesn't lose flavor. Not for us today, but understand back then when this statement was made, they did not have pure salt like we have today. They didn't have pure refined salt. They would take salt water from the seas around them. More often than not, they would do some mining as well. But they would take salt water, evaporate it, and what would be left would be salt. But there would also be a bunch of other minerals as well. It wouldn't be just pure salt. The salt over time would become polluted with these other minerals. Therefore, it would become no good. But it still has salt aspects. So they're not going to throw it on their farms or their gardens. It would, it would drown out the, the fruits and the vegetables. They're not going to eat it. It's polluted. It's not any good. What are you going to do with it? Would you like to know what they did with it? And tell me that the Bible is not accurate? They'd throw it on the roads. And people would just walk on it. Well, guess what Jesus just said? Salt loses its flavor. If you've turned from God, good for nothing now but being trampled upon the roads. The Hebrews writer in Hebrews chapter 10 talks about the severity of one such as this. He says, if you turn from Jesus Christ, if you turn from the salvation you have in Jesus Christ, what hope do you have? Meaning you shunned the only hope you did have. What hope do you have? Good salt, however, is maintained, not cast out. And when salt comes into contact with something else, this is an important part. So I want to make sure you take, away, take this away. If you've got that bland piece of chicken that I just cooked for you, because that's probably what it's going to be, and you have a salt shaker sitting there, said, I bet that salt's going to flavor this chicken up. Will it do you a bit of good if you don't take it out of the salt shaker and sprinkle it on there? You just leave it inside that salt shaker. It ain't going to help you a single bit. If you don't get the salt out where the salt can come into contact with something, it cannot flavor it. Just as you as a Christian, keeping the salt inside the shaker, not going out, not evangelizing, it's no good. It's not worth anything. It has to be let out of the salt shaker to do anyone any good. But a warning with that. If you have an open wound and you dump salt on it, How's that going to feel? People don't like that a whole lot. So you need to remember that, that you may try to be taking the salt out of the shaker. People aren't always going to like it. It doesn't feel good in open wounds. The next point quickly. Christians are the light of the world. Jesus said, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father that is in heaven. Light is meant to be seen, not hidden. Just as the sun doesn't illuminate the sky to then be covered up and made dark, light and darkness do not go together. In fact, the two cannot go together. They absolutely cannot go together. So I'm going to look at just a couple of characteristics of light. I'm, I'm only doing two. Light exposes darkness. Light exposes darkness. Do you know what the definition of darkness is? The absence of light. That is what darkness means. What would you rather do if I were to give anyone in here the option? Especially the ladies. Because I may not be, I still don't want to do it, but I wouldn't necessarily be afraid to do it. But I'm going to give you two options. Would you rather go for a nice afternoon stroll at the park with the sun setting and it's a nice afternoon, you can see everything very clearly? Or would you like to go back to that same part about two o'clock park about 2 o'clock in the morning for the same stroll? But why? Same park. Same stroll. 
Tyler, what normally happens at night? That's when the crazies come out. They're there in the day. Light exposes darkness. Things are hidden in the dark that you cannot see. Evil lurks in darkness. <coughs> but you know what it takes to expose darkness? One light. That's all. <coughs> Excuse me. It takes one light. One light and everything is exposed. Man, that was a good shot right there. 1 Thessalonians 5, with this idea of exposing darkness, one flicker of light. You see the moon in the night sky, it's not dark anymore. It's still dark outside, but you can see. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. But you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of night nor of darkness. Without God in our society, what would it look like? Would it be a light-filled, pleasant, happy place? Well, no, you, you remove the morality, you remove the inherent guiding principles that come from God. What's left? What fills the voids? What sucks in the vacancies there? Without God, hope dissipates. It also stands to reason, if you go back to what we just read with Sodom and Gomorrah, if the light is turned out here in this world, and this world turns 100% dark, not 10, what reason does God have to let this earth keep spinning? Why? Why would He? What would be the reason He would? Which brings me to the next point, the final point here. Light is visible. You can see the light. I'm looking right at a lot. I can see it very clearly. And I've mentioned this before. Is darkness a real thing? Does darkness exist? Well, darkness is the absence of light, right? Darkness is not a thing. It's a situation. Darkness occurs... When you take the light away, that's when we get darkness. When light is present, darkness goes away. But when it comes to light, there's one very important aspect to remember. The source matters. If your light comes from a lampstand and you let that lampstand run out of fuel, guess what happened to your light? No more light. If your light comes from a lamp plugged in your house and you didn't pay the power bill this month, you tried to trade salt for it. No more light. For a Christian, our light comes from Jesus Christ. If we are plugged into Him, He is our source of light, it will never run out. It will never extinguish. Ephesians 5 says, For you were once darkness, but you were light in the Lord. Walk as children in the light. Now, I'm going to let you in on something, and I, I don't know that I was really going to mention this, because I don't want you to take away my takeaway from something. I want you to do this on your own. When I read this passage to get my notes ready for this sermon, it was like I was hit in the face with a brick. I had missed something that I have read in here dozens of times and it had never jumped out at me like this before and I don't know why but it did Jesus told Christians to do what with your light let it shine before men you say well yeah I just read that what, what makes that such a big deal you know what it doesn't say in that passage that hit me so hard it doesn't say make your light shine you don't have to do anything you don't make it shine and I had missed that after reading this dozens of times. Jesus said, let your light shine. The light's there. If you are a Christian, if you have accepted Jesus Christ, the light is there. You don't have to make it do anything. He just said, let it shine. Let it shine. We shouldn't have to do anything. 
But then that comes to a question. Is Jesus in your heart? Because that's the source of the light. And if Jesus is in your heart and that light is shining, then you will be glorifying God and it will be seen by men. So I'm going to wrap up with this. And I mentioned this already, but one of the closing parts of that song that I've listened to probably 30 times in the last three weeks. And I mentioned it already in the sermon. I said, imagine if the church on Sunday was still the church on Monday. Jesus didn't say, make your light shine. He said, let your light shine. Isn't that incredible that it's, it comes back to our choice? Because he also didn't say, I'm going to make your light shine in you. You have to choose to let your light shine before men. Without Jesus Christ, there is no hope. If salt becomes flavorless, it's worth nothing. It's cast out and it's trampled upon. Light's not meant to be covered up under a bushel, it's meant to shine. If you are not a child of God, my question for you is this before we have our invitation song. What hope do you have? Jesus Christ is it. Jesus Christ paid the price so that you don't have to make, you can let. You can let your, your light shine. You can become a child of God by repenting of your sins, confessing the name of Jesus Christ, that He is the Son of God, and being baptized in a watery grave for the remission of your sins. Maybe you've done that already. Maybe you have. But my final message to the brethren here, as well as those online with us today, and again, I mentioned this already, salt in a shaker does no one any good. Light covered up can't brighten anything. Jesus said, you are, not should be, not could be. If you put on that name Christian, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. So let it shine before men. This is your opportunity now. Whatever you're in need of, come now as we stand and sing this invitation song. If the name of the Savior is precious to you, if your care has been constant and tender and true, if the light of His presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell of your gladness today? Oh, will you not tell it today? Will you not tell it today? If the light of His presence brighten your way, oh, will you not tell it today? If the souls all around you are living in sin, if the Master has told you to bid them come in, if the lead invitation they never have heard, oh, will you not tell them the cheer-bringing word? Oh, will you not tell it today? Will you not tell it today? of His presence has brightened your day, oh, will you not tell it today? Please be seated. <coughs> Let's sing number 337 to prepare our minds to take the Lord's Supper together. 337. Let's sing the first verse on. Lo in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave. 
brave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives for ever with the saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Does everyone have their communion cups? This is the opportunity that we have as Christians now to commemorate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the price that he was willing to pay on the cross for our sins. But this is the opportunity for us now to reflect on ourselves, reflect on our hearts and where we are as we partake of this emblem. There are warnings against taking so un in a manner unworthily of Jesus Christ. So I encourage you at this time, put away all the thoughts and the cares and the concerns Focus on the cross of Calvary. Focus on what that cross meant. Pray with me if you will. Our holy God and Father in heaven, hallowed be thy great name. Our Father, we offer our thanksgiving for this sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the willingness that he had not to have his life taken, but to lay it down on the cross for our sins. As we partake of this bread, Father, that, was, that represents his body, may we do so in a manner well-pleasing into thy sight and according to thy word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I do believe that it's everybody. Bow with me once again, if you will. Our holy God and Father in heaven, now we offer our thanks for this fruit of the vine that represents the blood of Jesus Christ flowed on Calvary's cross. Father, we're so thankful that we have this blood of Jesus that washes us free of our sins. May we partake of this in a manner pleasing to thy sight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. Now as we have an opportunity, let's uh, give back as we have been prospered and blessed by God. Pray with me once again, if you will. Our holy God and Father in heaven, now we give you thanks for the blessings of this life that you have given us. The skills, the abilities to be able to earn a living and provide for our families, provide for ourselves. Now we, we pray that we search our hearts that we give back as we have laid aside to do so. Giving doesn't come from the hand but from the heart, Father, and I pray that as we do so, we search our hearts to give as we have set aside that works here at the Uport Church of Christ may be continued. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.